So thanks so much for having me here. So I tried to do something popular, and that's always dangerous, as you all know, right? It could be super trivial, uh, or it could be that I think it's popular and you think it's uh, not understandable. So at least I have put in one or two jokes, which I hope are <laughs> accessible for everybody, and you will appreciate them. Uh, and you see, nanoscience is something that, that, that is nothing new in that sense. So I start out with a few transparency, but how nanoscience actually started and, and what it could be. So, um, you know, I'm from Switzerland. Switzerland is a small country. That's fantastic to do nanoscience, you know. Everything in Switzerland <laughs> is not. Cities are small, uh, universities are small, at least if you compare them to Chinese universities. And this is an image of Switzerland with atomic resolution. As you can see, this was taken at the University of Basel. And I think it's important to note that you know, nano is really a Greek word and it means dwarf. So everything that's small is beautiful. So we will talk about small things. And now what nano really is is actually interesting. I mean, we as scientists, we all know that a nano is 10 to the minus 9 meters. But I think if you talk to the general public, they have completely forgotten that this is actually a unit, right? So um, here I show you something that I stole from my friends in high energy physics. You know, high energy physics, they are the heroes of the world. They understand really what holds our universe together. And this is what they look at. You know, this is, I hope you can see my point here. 60 orders of magnitude that they cover. You know, this goes from Big Bang to the universe, a wide range. And now if you look at the length scales of nanoscience, it's actually quite modest. It's something like maybe two, three, four lengths, uh, uh, orders of magnitude here. We're talking something like we start from atoms to molecules to clusters to things that we can hold in our hands. But the interesting feature is that these are the same length scales as the length scales of light. Well, it's going from atoms too, but then it goes up all the way up to complete organisms and I've brought you here. <laughs> so you see, that, that's an interesting span for nanoscience. We start with units that atoms, I think we take atoms as given. Is it okay with you, Thomas? Maybe more <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, but I think this is one of the driving forces, or it used to be one of the driving forces that everybody got together who thought that they know what a nanometer is. So here is, I think, one of the stars. You know, this is the, uh, what, what President Bill Clinton said in, in the year 2000, which is almost 20 years ago. So it tells you nano is nothing new. When they started the, uh, the National Nanotechnology Initiative in the US, it's interesting that this initiative went through all the administrations. It went from Democrats to Republicans to Democrats. Even today, they still receive money. I think today they think nano.gov means downsizing of the US government. Uh, it's still there, the webpage, and it's actually an interesting webpage. Let me show you another one here. This is uh, something on nano competence. So this is something where you should be careful, right? If you use the word nano, we know that this is very little competence. Very this is uh, a center of excellence in, in Germany. And I found another one. This is nano banking. Again, I would not invest there. <laughs> nano banking system, and you see that nano has been established as a word that uh, is very unique and used by many different people. Okay, now let's go back to science. Uh, what is? Why did we arrive there? Why did we even think about nano? And I think it basically comes from semiconductor physics. It basically comes from Moore's law. In Moore's law, as you all know, you plot the number of transistors per chip on a logarithmic scale, and you have the year on a linear scale. And we know this growth uh, is exponential, basically for 60 years. And you know, we hit the 100 nanometer line actually quite some time ago. So the industry has hit this line 10 years ago, and industry is now dealing with 10 nanometer transistors. So industry is really fully into this nanometer regime, and they can do things that we have a hard time establishing in our life. But there is a lot of crossover, and I think nano is an interesting field because it basically started from the necessity of industry, then all the scientists jumped on it and used the different tools, and now we produce things that go back into industry, but we also profit from the technology that industry has developed. I mean, the wonderful clean room, for example, that you hear at, here at SciTech, it's full of industrial tools that were originally developed by companies, and now our research profits back from these wonderful tools. 
So here is another version of Moore's law. This is the number of electrons per device, uh, again on a logarithmic scale, and that's the here on a linear scale, and you see there's this shrinkage here, and obviously in the not so distant future, we expect one electron per transistor, and you know that every practical device has errors, so if your error is plus minus one, and you have one electron, then you run into a problem. So uh, and things like that are happening already now. They have been happening in the lab for 10 years now, but they're also happening now in industry, and that's one of the reasons why, as you know, Moore's law is coming to an end. Okay, now let me talk a little bit more about physics. So usually in physics, we love to talk about equilibrium, right? We love to talk about things that are steady, that are slow, that we can measure. And uh, I showed you here an example. You take a resistor and you apply voltage and measure a current. And usually we like it if this current voltage characteristic is linear and uh, we can take our time to measure that. But uh, real life is more complicated. If you, for example, sit here at zero applied voltage and you measure the current, this current fluctuates as a function of time. And we all know that, and we hate it, right? Usually, as an experimentalist, if things fluctuate and if there's noise in the experiment, you try to get rid of it. And we all know that there are many noise sources, there are mechanical instabilities, there, are, uh, there is 50 hertz no uh, noise on most of our signals. And uh, if you look carefully enough, then you, you try to find out what is the reason for this noise, and then you try to get rid of it. But there is also something interesting in this noise. If you're really looking at very small systems, and the smaller you make your system, and that's the goal of nanoscience, the smaller you make them, the more important become fluctuations. So if you have 10 to the 23 electrons and 10 of those jump around, you can hardly see that. But if you have one electron, and that electron has noise, that's dramatic, right? So fluctuations are important. So let me tell you about an experiment that we did recently. And I think it's probably the simplest experiment one can do in condensed metaphysics. It doesn't get any simpler. So what do we do? So this is the surface of a gallium arsenide heterostructure. It contains highly mobile electrons below the surface. And then there are these gates here on top. And these gates allow you to deplete the electron gas below. And that gives rise to constraints where the electrons can move. So at the end of the day, if you think there is one electron here, this electron is confined in this potential well over here, and it has one exit. The exit here is closed, this one is closed, there is one exit. So it's one electron coupled to one lead. So if you think about a transistor, it's completely useless because there is no current flow. Right? There is just, you can just flow in and flow out. There are not even two leads. So what can you even measure? Right? Now it's one electron. Can you explain why, why it is closed? Because not all people are... Okay, so these white lines here, these are metallic gates on the surface. If you apply negative voltages to these gates, you deplete the electron gas below, and therefore you create barriers, uh, basically insulators. So you could think of all of these white lines being insulators in the plane, and the little electron, it can sit here in this little well, or it can jump out to this large reservoir which then is sort of a macroscopic lead with a Fermi-Dirac distribution and so forth. Is that, is that what you meant? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, now how do you measure that? Well, what we do is, we, you know, we have another circuit here. So the, here is macroscopic area, here is macroscopic area, here is another constriction. So we send some current through here, and this current is tiny because we have a constriction, and this current is very sensitive to its environment. So if you change this voltage here a little bit, you make this constriction a little wider or a little <coughs> narrower, and therefore the current goes up and down. And in particular, on the right-hand side, if there's an electron here on the right-hand side, it has capacitive crosstalk to the left-hand side. So if I measure this current on the left-hand side, I can actually measure whether there's an electron on the right-hand side. So in an energy picture, that looks like that. This is my Fermi Dirac distribution of my lead over here, so I consider that to be a standard metal. Vertical axis is energy. The, bla uh, the black curve or the gray curve is the Fermi Dirac distribution. Somewhere here is the Fermi energy, which I can tune by tuning my gates. And then there's a discrete state here that contains one electron. If this discrete state is above the Fermi energy, you see the electron jumps out. 
If this discrete state is below, the electron go from the leak jumps in. So these are the two possibilities. Now, if I measure this current here, and I measure this current as a function of time, it jumps between two values. And these two values correspond to the situation that the electron is in the dot or it's in the lead. So I basically have a, a transistor, but the transistor has only one lead. So I cannot measure the current that flows because the time average current is zero. But if I have time resolution and look at the time, it's one second, it's a macroscopic time, you can see these electrons sitting in the dot or going out. So I see this going back and forth. And so you see these are fluctuations. And these fluctuations are of fundamental quantum mechanical origin. These fluctuations arise because quantum mechanical tunneling is a stochastic process. You see also these small fluctuations here. This is our experimental noise. This has to be smaller than the size of one of those jumps. So now we have a little tool, and that tool allows us to say my electron is here or my electron is not here. So it's really the simplest you can do in condensed matter physics. Take one electron and ask the question, is it in or out? Now you might wonder, if that's an utterly boring question, right? This should have been studied tens of years ago. And it's interesting that one can still learn things about a single electron. Let me tell you that. So you see, you can look at the average time out and the average time in. So that's an occupation probability, right? You can say, within one second, I don't know, 50% of the time, the electron was in the dot or was out of the dot. So this gives you an occupation probability. But you can also calculate how many steps do I have per second. That's how often per second my electron is able to tunnel. That's a tunnel rate. So I can calculate a tunnel rate, which is the average times it's the electron spans in and out of the dot. So I can measure the tunneling in time and the tunneling out time. And I can measure uh, occupation probabilities. All funny. So for example, let's, let's look at the extrapolation. So you have an electron, and the electron goes in and goes out. But look, look at this number here and the saturation here. That's not the same number as the saturation here. So tunneling in and tunneling out seems to be something different. So we take these rates, and they are depend on the tunneling rates times the Fermi Dirac function, and to go in, you need the Fermi Dirac function of the occupied states. To go out, you need 1 minus the Fermi Dirac function. That's the probability of the empty states. So all of these things are known basic. So now, let's look at these two extrapolations. We find they are different by a factor of 2. So there's a different probability to tunnel into the dot than tunnel out of the dot. <coughs> it's a factor of 2. Where could this factor of 2 come from? Well, it comes from the fact that the electronic state is twofold degenerate. So we are not surprised, right? This is what Pauli told us a long time ago. Every single particle state can contain a spin up and a spin down electron. Here we have one single electron. So what's happening? Let's look on the lower left. So what's happening there is an electron that comes from the metal and it wants to hop on the dot. On the dot, there is one discrete state, but it's twofold degenerate because of spin degeneracy. So it has two places to go. Let's look at the other end over here. So the electron sits in one of the two states, and it needs to go out. So it's just one electron. There's one possibility. So this one is twice as likely as this one. The tunneling barrier is exactly the same, but the density of states is different for the two processes. So this difference here is simply the degeneracy of a state. And it's interesting that this was the first measurement to do that. We would think, well, we have known that a long time ago. But it's actually not so simple to measure the degeneracy of a quantum mechanical state. And now, of course, you can start dreaming and say, well, there are other degeneracies. There are more complicated materials. There's been orbit interaction. There are valley degeneracies and so forth. So this is a method to actually measure degeneracies. Very simple experiment. OK. Now let's have another look at this curve. I think this is very fascinating. You see, when are the tunneling rates the same? When is it? The same probability that the electron goes in or goes up. It happens when these two curves cross, and that's not at zero energy. That's not when the two energies are the same. So what's happening here? So we have to go to a finite energy so that it's actually equally likely to go in and out. So what does that mean? Now you take these equations, you know this is all known. The Fermi-Dirac functions are known, and the and out rates are known. And you can calculate, you simply take these two curves, you set them equal to each other, 
and you find at which energy are they the same. And you find this equation down there. It's just very simple mathematics. So the, the change in energy is determined by kT times logarithm 2. So there, there's no material parameter here, no gallium arsenide, no effective mass. It's just the basis. So what is this? So I'm sure many of you have seen this energy. This energy is basically what Landauer calculated a long time ago. And he asked himself the question, what energy does it take to erase a classical bit? There's a finite amount of energy. Or you could ask yourself the question, what is the minimal energy with which we could operate a classical computer? And then this would be the energy for one bit, and then, of course, you have more bits. So our typical computers, they operate at energy scales that are like five orders of magnitude higher. So we are far from that limit. So why does this equation show up here? Well, now we can lean back and we can look at the system from a point of view of information theory. So what is a bit? A bit is a system where you know it's in state zero or one, right? If the bit is erased, you don't know anymore in which state it is. So now let's consider our quantum dot as a bit. So classical bit, and then we would say electron is in or electron is out. So then the question is, how much energy does it take to erase that information? In other words, at what energy do I no longer know where the electron is? And that's exactly here, because the tunneling in and tunneling out rate is the same. So I can interpret that number as if I have measured the Landauer energy to erase the classical bit. So it's all in that very simple experiment with one single electron and one unit. OK. So two electrons in a double well potential, right? So now you have two possibilities to do that. Either one electron is left and one electron is right, or both electrons are in one of the two dots. And now you think, you can already see, life is more complicated. Because you remember, if you have two electrons in the same system, think about the helium atom, then these two electrons, they have an interaction with each other. And let's forget about the Coulomb interaction, there's the exchange interaction. So the two electrons, they actually like to be in a singlet state. So for helium or for hydrogen molecule, the two electrons are in a singlet state. They are not in a parallel state. So if, now the question is, what are the spins of these electrons? Because if they're antiparallel, they're in the same orbital state. If they are parallel, it's a different energy scale. And we see something like that. So we do the same experiment. We measure our current here and we monitor the difference between these two states. So one electron moves back and forth, and the other one stays. So now it looks very different. Look at this. This current as a function of time, now it doesn't change. And then, tuck, 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 electron goes back and forth. And then it doesn't change anymore. And tuck, 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 it goes back and forth. Very simple experiment, right? So what's happening now? We are now getting a new addition, a new degree of freedom. So basically, let's assume these two <coughs> electrons have anti-parallel spins. And we tune the system that these two levels are degenerate. So now this electron can easily go back and forth. We are looking at two states that have the same energy, and then the electron goes back and forth. But the spin doesn't keep its direction forever. It can change its direction. For example, by coupling to the nuclear spins of the lattice. This is a solid, this is gallium arsenide. Gallium has a nuclear spin, arsenic has a nuclear spin. So this electron spin can flip, and the nuclear spin in the lattice flips. If that happens, then suddenly the electron has the, long, the wrong spin, and it's stuck. This electron, if it has the wrong spin, it can't go to the left. And so you can directly see it's stuck. So you see directly spin physics here, and you see that there are two time scales here. You see there's a fast time scale. That's just the tunneling time, the electron going back and forth. And there are long time scales, and this is what we call spin blockade. This is the electron is stuck. And it is stuck until it flips its spin. And there are basically two mechanisms. One, the one that I just mentioned, which is interaction with nuclear spins, hyperfine interaction. And the other mechanism is spin orbit interaction. So in, in semiconductors and basically in all materials, there is always a coupling between the orbital state and the spin state. And so when an electron goes back and forth, Already the movement in real space actually means that the spin is slightly tilted. And you can imagine that measuring these times as a function of various parameters, you can actually find out what is the reason for the spin blockade and what is the dominant mechanism. Okay. And now, if you measure again left to right, right to left, 
So you see, this is one direction, blue is one direction, red is the other direction. And you see, they are not the same anymore. And now they differ by a factor of four. So why is that? Well, it's very simple. The reason is that if you have one electron on the right-hand side, there is just one state. If you're on the left-hand side, you have two electrons. And these two electrons, they can be in a singlet or in three triplet states. And if you tune it properly, those are degenerate, at least at zero magnetic field. <coughs> so for two electrons, you go from one degeneracy to four degeneracies. And that's this factor of four here in the rates. OK, so again, it agrees with this very simple-minded picture. OK, so there are lots of things that one can do from here. And I think the wonderful thing is that you built your, na it's all nanotechnology, right? Wouldn't have been possible without nanotechnology. And nanotechnology is so perfect these days that we can build these devices on, as we want. We can build three quantum dots that contain together one electron work that is delocalized over three systems. We can build five quantum dots with 10 electrons, and it basically all works. But we want to be, get better, right? We always want to get better, and there is graphene on the market. And the question is, what can you do with graphene? Graphene is wonderful because it's so thin. And because it's thin, it has the possibility that you can make things laterally even smaller than you can do in semiconductors. In semiconductors, everything lives below the surface. Whether you take silicon or gallium arsenide or any phosphide, it's always below the surface. So whatever you do to your surface has to penetrate down there to modulate your electronic properties. And because you're at finite depth, you are limited in size. And in graphene, you are right there. It's all 2D. But as we all know, graphene has a problem. Graphene doesn't have a band gap. And if you don't have a band gap, it's very hard to make insulators out of graphene. Graphene always conducts. Sometimes it doesn't conduct very well, but it always conducts. So what you can do is you take bilayer graphene, and bilayer graphene has a parabolic dispersion, so that's E versus K, but still no gap. And if you apply a vertical electric field, then people have shown that you can open a gap. So now suddenly you have something that you can actually tune with an electric field. If you take a semiconductor, it just has some gap, and you have to live with it. This one you can tune. And you can make it actually pretty large. You can make it up to 200 milli electron volts, at least theoretically. And that's already much larger than uh, KT at room temperature. So the gaps that we achieve in the lab are of the order of 50 milli electron volts. <coughs> and that's a new record. It used to be more like one or two milli electron volts. So now, how to build something like that with graphene? And there are many years of development in, in that, but I just walk you quickly through that without going <coughs> too much details. So this is. A piece of bilayer graphene, which is encapsulated by boronitride to keep it clean, which is encapsulated by graphite gates. So there are many clean layers on top of each other. So now you take the backgate and you take these green gates. So the dashed line outlines where bilayer graphene is. Now you take the green gate and use the backgate and you tune them such that the Fermi level is in the gap. So no electrons below the green gates depleted. Then you put down another insulator and put down the blue gates. And now the blue gates only tune what's happened in this little, little constriction. Here. So the current from source to drain flows along this channel. And now you can tune this little channel with one of the blue gates. And here's a 3D uh, brass string of that. And that's another schematic. So we want to measure this current. And all of the gates are tuned except for these blue ones here. And now if you measure the current as a function of one of those gates, or the conductance as a function of one of those gates. You see that you go from a situation where you have a gapped system in source and drain, but the Fermi level is always in the conduction band. So this is source drain, this is your little constriction, high conductance. Then you tune this little gate and you tune the band gap such that the Fermi level is in the gap and the conductance is completely quenched. So you can pinch off your transistor. And the nice thing is if you keep going, you start populating the valence band here. And you start filling it with individual holes. And here is a, a blow up of the situation. You go from one hole to two holes to three holes. You can find a bias spectroscopy for those who measure Coulomb diamonds. They are pretty large. They are 10 milli electron volts. They should actually get much larger than 25 milli electron volts. And then these guys should work at room temperature. And the nice thing, because it's all gate voltages, you just reverse all your gate voltages and you go to electrons. 
So it's something that's very hard to do in any semiconductor. And you can actually build a device, a double bell device, that has a hole on the left side and an electron on the right side. So now you can start thinking, I told you the easy stories with one electron and two electrons. Now think about what happens if you have one hole and one electron. Now we all know a, a hole is just a missing electron, but that doesn't make it easier, right? So you have a well, in one you have an electron, in the other one you have a missing electron. Now what happens to the degeneracies and things like that? So we haven't done that experiment, uh, but there's lots of interesting stuff in here. So why do we do that, right? We want to build a quantum computer. And I guess most of you want that too, right? <laughs> So I don't want to ask now each individual how you're going to do that, but it's actually it's a good plan, right? And the plan is not so hard. So you prepare a quantum state, right? You manipulate it and you read out. So it's just a three-step process and you have a quantum computer, right? So let me give you an example. So let's prepare a quantum state, right? So here, here's a quantum state. Okay. So now many of you would probably like to manipulate that quantum state, right? <laughs> So it's not that hard actually. You pay a pile of the two parts and manipulate <laughs> it, right? Um, and then you do something from quantum cryptography, privacy amplification, but that's not so useful. And you know quantum mechanics is hard, right? Because there is decoherence in the system, and you have to do some measurement at some point to so do a single charge readout. And there is some result. This is not that So this is a slide that, that I had it for you guys. Uh, something completely different. This is a scanning probe. This is, of course, uh, it's uh, fake in the movie, but it's real in the, in the experiment. What you see here is the surface of a semiconductor. And this is how you can write oxide lines of a semiconductor uh, by local anonic oxidation. I know many of you have worked with that on different materials. And I'm just showing that movie here because we had a discussion before this meeting. And I think this is something that would be wonderful if this could be extended to 2D materials. And it's beca again because 2D materials are so thin, so it should be relatively easy to, to oxidize them. I mean, if you just oxidize one layer, you don't need a lot of energy or oxygen, if you oxidize a semiconductor, it needs much more. So that's an example from a long time ago, and I think it's something you should be doing in the future. So that brings me to the end. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>